Yeah, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let David give a longer explanation than me, but I think that there's like a little bit of I think when when Norwegian black metal first popped off and people saw that these guys were burning churches and that the lead, you know, for instance, Mayhem got a lot of attention. You know, that they had burned churches. Their original singer killed himself or whatever. All this stuff. Um, there was some revisionist. Hit. At first, it was terrifying to the public. <laughs> it, it, well, yeah, just me. I mean, I remember this period of time. So, or, or hearing about it, you know, right around the age of 10 or 11, and I would have been like 93, 94, just everything about metal in general. And the media did a fantastic job of, yeah, scaring the shit out of, <laughs> out of kids like me, where I'm like, where is my Weezer CD? Yeah. So then maybe like with, with Rory McCaukin, when they made this movie, Lords of Chaos, and uh, David, you can talk about that too if you, if you want, we can discuss that. But I feel like maybe Rory was coming at it from this contrarian approach of like, well, when I studied it, what I actually found was that this guy was really just a nerd who wanted to be in a famous band and it just got away from him. Yeah, I don't think, I think that speaks to the depths that he did not study it. That's pretty superficial. Yeah, it kind of, it, it is superficial. It kind of just goes like, there's nothing under the surface here. Yeah. There's nothing else to even uh, look into or understand about this particular phenomenon. They were just nerds. See, that that's done a lot today, actually. I, I always say, um, just this is my pushing my own propaganda, but I always say that... Um, summarizing a whole movement with a single soundbite is comedy or intellectualism which is also comedy that takes itself too seriously yeah i i think you're right on on that point because you know in comedy when writing jokes um whether it's stand-up skit form movie you use generalizations in order yeah exactly so but I guess if if you're trying to understand like a, a whole movement and really find its core, you can't use a generalization. Otherwise, it does become uh, comical. Yeah, and a lot of times you can use comedy, as you know, to even poke holes in those types of generalizations or or whatever. Just like I just did about intellectuals. Um, but yeah, we see that happen still today with the movements of today we could use this black metal idea as an analogy uh, where everything today is also reduced to a binary belief system where whole swaths of people usually half a nation is categorized in some low resolution light and denounced yeah and it i mentioned in the last one it does work you know if you are the church and someone's burning your church down that's satan to you but satan is a is a Christian construct. So I just try to be careful not to uh, assign motives or guess intentions or uh, stuff like that. But I, I do have a bias because I, I love black metal. I found it as a kid. Obviously I thought it was cool when you're a teenager and you're a musician and I'm a lifelong curious musician. And I was as dark as a child could be as melancholic as as they came you know i was wearing corpse paint to school and did did you get in trouble for that did they tell you to take the paint off because nowadays you could just say you identify as a guy who wears paint and they'd be like do do you want a litter box in the bathroom you know like they don't care anymore but back then it was i mean we couldn't even wear certain shirts yeah yeah I was going to say that I was I was pretty ahead of the whole trans movement because <laughs> I was getting uh, expelled from school for wearing floor length dresses and robes back in these days. I would fight every day. I I fought someone every day because if you looked like I looked, yeah. you would fight and you weren't accepted and there was no community to support you. But that's another conversation no. maybe for a separate podcast david so why you were at this point in your life were you also i mean were you writing song lyrics were you writing poetry yeah i was already playing i i started writing about when i was seven i would say around around the age of seven i found this stuff intriguing just like 
you know, Detroit Esham or ICP or whatever, when you find it as mm, maybe a 12, uh, 11 or 12 year old, uh, you start diving in. Yeah. I, I remember, yeah, we did too. Like I had a buddy that played ICP, you know, and, um, even his mom was in the car. We couldn't even drive yet. And I'm like, your mom's cool with this, <laughs> but what was your view on ICP? Yeah, they're awesome. They're awesome guys. They've always been cool to us, good to us, supported us. And when I was a kid, I obviously didn't know them. I just found them and thought, wow, this is the coolest shit I've seen in a while. <laughs> When you're a kid, you love everything. My favorite song of theirs is probably Magic, the one about how everything's magic. Because have you heard that song? I don't know, dude. It's it's like Austin. That could be about two hundred of them. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, this one is like about magnets. You know, he's like magnets. Shit. How do they work? Yeah, that was. Yeah, that I I gotta hop in and defend Shaggy for a second because he said he wrote that because he they got clowned for that a lot and Shaggy was like well, I was they right. They shouldn't have got clowned. No pun intended. Because I personally, um, I think the song's hilarious, but also I mean. I like it. So I don't know if he was being intentional or what. I just thought it- he he said that he wrote that from his pers- from the perspective of his kid. You know how like everything seems like magical to a kid. I mean, like oh if- well, dude, that makes perfect sense. That makes if you think of it, if he's writing, if he's channeling the thought process of a child, I, I get that completely. Yeah. Now that that added some clarity on on it and not going like, hey, dude. Just Google how magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was deeper than that, but it, yeah. it's kind of like with what David's saying. People just saw it at the surface and were like, "These guys don't know how magnets work." And it's like, okay, well, if you would have taken a second to actually figure out where he's coming from, you know, you would see that he meant it from like the perspective of a of a child. But um, going it, back to that time, intellectual time. elitism, where um, now that everybody has Google, everybody <laughs> knows everything. Yeah, it's just like people clown people online for spelling when they can't make a valid point against what they say or their arguments. They comment on their spelling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or just like an ad a hominal and attack. You know, where you just attack. That's what most people say. Uh, completely overlooking the idea that the computer checks your spelling for you entirely, and that there's really nothing to speak about uh, when it comes to people's spelling skills. But yeah, getting back to a. Uh, uh, the bands I, uh, again, personally found them when I was when I was a kid. The Mayhem's and the and the yeah. stuff like that, and they were more entertaining. Uh, even the more entertaining ones, like my friends that love, like black metal, uh, think I'm a poser because I liked Cradle of Filth. Uh, <laughs> but I I love Danny's writing and my friend Rich Shaw. He played with cradle for a few years and he plays with us and yes and he's awesome and i always thought they were really good and at this age and what what so what instruments did you start playing when you were a kid guitar that was the one i think most kids start with with was the guitar yeah yeah and and then if you have no musical inclination whatsoever you start with the bass like i tried to my buddy was so good at every instrument right when about eighth grade and i'm like oh man i gotta play too but i just i could not pull it together i tried that yeah i tried guitar and then my fingers are just sausages yeah d- bassists always get get uh, people always make fun of bassists for that <laughs> they do but i i kind of think the vocalist is the last stop like that's where you go when you can't play anything the bass is still an instrument yeah yeah, because like you, you know, I mean, think about Flea and Anthony Kiedis. Anthony Kiedis can't play a single guitar lick, and then you know, Flea is the master of the bass. Yeah, so that's a that's exactly a good analogy. So I was I, I can still play some stuff. You know, I still contribute and write and stuff like that. But if I get a microphone and get up there, I can really rock the house. You know what I mean? <laughs> well. I th- I, that brings me, I wanted to talk about the, you know, black metal musically, because in the last episode I had kind of said, was the music an afterthought? And the reason why I said that was because there was the, Varg has said that when he was recording Mayhem, he was like, give us the shittiest mic you have. I want this to sound like shit. And 
but the point of that was that even the music was like a statement like the the and david i think you had said that they intentionally made their logos hard to read um you know like the the music the way that it sounds um was like a statement and you had said when we were done talking last time you're like sometimes it's nice to just listen to something harsh and so i put that to test this week i was driving and i was feeling just like in a mood where I wasn't necessarily mad or happy, I was just kind of numb. And so I was like, I'm going to listen to some mayhem. And it was just the dude screaming. And I'm like, I, I'm i vibing with this right now. It's good to mix it up, you know, from, from an adult perspective now. When you're a kid, you know, uh, I was a 13-year-old Wiccan, you know, just even steeped in paganism in the middle of the ghetto is a real sight to see. I think another thing that I wanted to to touch on regarding your question was another factor that might be worth looking into or even just asking you to about is the energized youth. That's kind of the common denominator that we have here. I'm sure we all remember it, the that youthful kind of Zeus energy that you had as a teenager. Yeah. You know, I, don't get me wrong, I'm smarter, faster, stronger, and wiser as I sit here today than I was. But do you remember that Zeus kind of focus and energy that you could have about a thing before the world completely beat you down? Oh, dude, I think about that all the time. I think that that was at work here. Yeah. Maybe primordial archetypes like we, we discussed a minute ago, but I'd like to just remember the time it makes me feel a little bit good because i don't believe anyone especially say someone in control of this country like a politician or something i don't believe well partly because they're centarians at this point but i don't believe any of them remember um that youthful they're not in touch with it they might remember it uh but i don't i don't think any of them are in touch with that or how many how many uh, how many of these people never tapped into that? You know, if you never, did you ever rebel as a kid? Have you ever broken anything as a kid? Because, yeah, I went through a, I went through a period of time where um, I broke shit as a kid too. You know, and if if you've never experienced that, um, you know, maybe you're not in touch with that. Uh, you know, you don't know what it's like to to feel that way and to just say like I'm going to go out and break something and for no reason other than because I want to. You know what I mean? Exactly. I th- I think that's a huge part of of it. And it kind of makes me think of the whole movement in itself as being surrounded with the Satanism idea. The Satanism is is the adversary to Christ. It's a completely Christian idea. When you participate in Satanism, you're participating in Christianity, even if you're opposing it. Yeah. And I think it's valuable to to look at the idea of being anti um so get an idea of ignoring the anton levey ideology because that's not norse really at all i think that was american satanism and i also think that he hijacked piecemeal other philosophies but i think the christ satan good evil um thing that came from here and it was happening over there as well um satan uh, was the kind of burning churches rebellion break things that you were talking about and i think the arsonists say explicitly yes that they're against the liberal hypocritical ideas of the church like yeah. ex- gays or female priests or and all these things and then you start to think these people are acting more christian than christians these are all early christian ideas being closed-minded about gay or being liberal about the ideas of women um you could say that these church burners were more conservatively christian or more aligned with the traditional Christian values than the actual church that it was being. I, I, yeah, I guess w- what I would say with that is that um, the brand of Christianity in Norway was not would not be what I consider uh, Christianity, right? So, um, but I what I mean by that is how they they banned curtains, they banned television, they they banned all these things. That what does that have to do with Christianity? You know, what what does banning a curtain 
have to do with Christianity. That's got nothing to do with it. And you know, in, in the book Lords of Chaos, he he talks about how, um, uh, the, you know, like ninety percent of people in Norway didn't even go to church. Like they 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 can they were considered themselves Christian. It was it was like the it was like a political you know ideology. Um, you know, there are there are rules in Christianity. Obviously, there are, there are standards that um, you know that Christians. Um, obviously myself being one, you know, that we consider these rules to have, have come directly from God. Doesn't mean we always understand them. Now, what that, what that means though, too, <clears throat> is if you see somebody who's not a Christian, uh, breaking these rules, uh, that, that you hold yourself to as a Christian, you know, my, I don't expect Christian behavior from people who aren't Christians. You know, my, my first conversation with someone would be like, well, why what do, why do you not believe in God? You know, let's let's start there. Um, you know, that's that's uh, the the difference there. So these people probably saw the church as being very harsh and judgmental. They probably didn't explain that, you know, they probably never heard a good explanation for anything ever when it came to Christianity. They probably just really vague straw man arguments or statements that made no sense to them, you know, and they probably didn't see Christian love. That's why like uh there was a quote from the Romans where they were like, what are these guys, like when Christianity was popping off in Rome, they were known for their love, for the free food, for the, for the gatherings that they were doing, you know? Um, so I, I, I get where, where you're saying there, where it's like they, they, what they saw as Christianity, I just, to me, that's just, that's not it. You know, whatever it was in Norway was a uh, political conservative, um, Maybe a way to control the people. I don't know, but I to me, I'm like that's got nothing to do with uh, you know Jesus dying for your sins. I guess just to no pun intended, play devil's advocate. Yes, it makes me think that we're talking about a small group of people, a handful of bands, some Satanists, some just Norse mythological archetype people. Yeah, and we're talking about a couple murders. Um, in in Norway, literally, yeah, a couple, yes, and you kind of can't help me anyway. I can't help but feel propagandized, you know, because football hooligans kill more people in a year than this whole movement, yeah, did in ten years. Good point, and, yeah. And we're not diving into hooligans, yeah. So I would just say, you know. From the Kabbalion says everything is dual and there's a polarity. The en- enemy of the church is a formidable enemy, as we said. Some violent, some brutal, some revenge, but some are intellectuals and the violent actions are taken, but they're byproducts of the beliefs they're fighting for. And you don't necessarily have to be fighting the idea that Jesus died for your sins. You know, from from one perspective, it's absurd to think that a couple young men are exceptional picking on a tradition that is responsible for the deaths of five million people yeah um, we're talking about two guys you're talking about a couple murders and we're talking about some churches being burned um the crusades alone killed five million people and yet we are not talking about the crusades we're talking yeah. about a few goth kids making some music yeah. so yeah. i just Again, I, I have to stick up for these guys, not really because I align with their beliefs or anything, but it's it's funny that we kind of painted in the light that these few handfuls of, of goths were bullying the church as a collective. Yes, I agree you with what you're that. saying. Yeah. It's, it's hilarious uh, to think about it in that way. And it makes me think of that danger of being anti you know, because when you're anti, you can be controlled by your enemy. Yeah. Um, and we see that a lot today. It's not about having a real conviction or a real thought or a real belief. It's yeah. about not believing what the people you don't align with believe. So yeah. Christianity created Satan as an adversary in the Christian fundamental society. There's laws and there's commandments and order and rule. Religion acknowledges that there are human impulses towards sin and it yeah. acknowledges human nature and it preaches restraint and humility on these as virtues right yeah. it, it says that our nature is not perfect and and 
we're going to want to be one way, but you have to not do so and you got to restrain from that. So the anti that would be the opposite. So you think of, you know, in a satanic adversarial way, the first commandment, thou shall not have no other gods. Well, anti means you should have uh, the opposite, uh, be it Satan or or more gods, just a handful more. Yeah. And that comes with the, the Norse kind of idea. Honor thy mother and the father. The anti of that would be to dishonor them. Thou shall not kill. The anti of that would be that we should kill anyone. So you see what I mean? How being yes. anti something, you kind of, you're kind of, your hands are tied and they kind of have control and you're kind of beholden to the ideology of the enemy. And when the ideology of the enemy switches, if you retain that enemy, you have to change your beliefs. And then that's when you start to realize you don't really have any beliefs. You're just being anti. And yeah. we see this today more often than we realize most people only believe things they believe because someone they are told not to like or that they think they don't like believes the opposite of that. Yeah. If you look at every politician who lined up and said they wouldn't take Trump's vaccine because it was rushed and it was leaky <laughs> as if he was in a lab himself developing a, you know, Trump with a lab coat. <laughs> um, you know, the same company was responsible for the production of the vaccine, no matter who was in office. Yes. And as soon as he was out of office, they all, after lining up and saying they wouldn't take it, the moment he was gone, they lined up and did a federal mandated marketing campaign and yes. all lined up and preached that everyone needs to go out and get 10 boosters. So yes, that's why I say when I, when I say that they don't have real beliefs or convictions, because you, you watch anyone with a search engine can see politicians flip flopping on all of their beliefs uh, basically every year. Yeah. And so th those aren't real convictions. They're pseudo opinions and being anti is whatever the opponent believes, whatever is good or bad or harmful or safe, anything. And that's the, the problem with anti and that's what it does. So at the root Satanism, Christianity says, control impulses in human nature and satanism says do whatever you feel yeah and you know that's not to say you shouldn't have convictions or beliefs or fight for your causes or uh, but it's probably not okay to become entirely possessed by an ideology you know what i yeah, mean yeah i think that what you're saying there makes uh makes complete sense and <laughs> i always if you I feel like every community has the group of kids that, and they, they change maybe throughout time, but they were kind of like maybe the, the goth kids or the kids that wanted to dress in black and they like to hang out in the woods. And, um, you know, to the outsiders, they're freaky, but to them, you know, it's, that's some of it is tongue in cheek. Some of it is, is just that rebellion, that energy. Do you get what I'm saying there? And, and I feel like that's kind of where some of this came from, where it's like that in this particular community, um, they made the reason why I feel like they really blew up. Like Varg talks about it. He's like, yeah, I burned a few churches and then I got arrested. And then when I was in prison, way more churches got burned down because that's all the media talked about. He's like, they made it some big satanic thing. And, and like you had said, he's like, I don't believe in that, <laughs> you know, but, but think about it from a headline perspective, from a magazine perspective, you know, Satan, murder, burning churches, like that's going to sell, that's going to scare people, that's going to keep people hooked, and that's what they're in the business of doing. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right, and I think they're doing it today better than ever, and I think they're, you know, there's government intervention into corporation, there's corporation intervention into Dude, government. and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole real quick, but like I'm going to say this, like I went and saw that movie, The Sound of Freedom. Right. And uh, do, CNN's out there saying it's a QAnon conspiracy. It's like people are being trafficked. That's not a conspiracy. You're, you are the conspiracy theorist if you don't believe it's happened. Like, go talk to somebody who works on the border. Go talk to people. Go listen to interviews. Like, this is, you are the conspiracy theorist if you think it's not happening. You know, so that's an example, case in point, right now, today. That's a, a good point about that anti, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, you find yourself in a position where you're making excuses or, or making alibis or narratives for yeah. children coming up missing. Yeah. What type of, again, it, it's not about a belief or a conviction. I, I genuinely don't believe anyone at CNN believes 
that this, you know, maybe they did, don't like the movie or I assume most of them haven't even seen it, but I don't understand how anyone can make a case that number one, children aren't coming up missing and number two, that it's a bad thing. Yeah. I, it's almost as if they don't though, right? Yeah. They, what they do is they just say a bunch of words around it. Yes. No, no one at CNN comes out and says, you know what? Children are coming up missing and this is a good thing for America. They're not, they're not saying that they're just doing a hit piece on a movie saying that it's a, you know, a, a conspiracy. But remember that 18 months ago, uh, what we call truth today was also a conspiracy. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, that's, that kind of harkens back to that anti stuff and, and how skilled the media is. And there's, there's a quote in, in Lords of Chaos about, there's an interview with a guy and he talks about legitimizing hatred and what it does is it kind of justifies whatever extreme you want to take it to yeah. like hitler said it's okay to to hate the jews but hitler wasn't even unique in what he did it's been happening for thousands of years the serbs says it's okay to hate muslims and he he talks about when it's okay to hate something you step over a, a line in your psyche and I think this is where Satanism spins off the rails, you know, because in most religion, there is forgiveness, second chances, redemptions, mercy. Well, what's the opposite of that? That's condemnation, no forgiveness, no redemption. And to me, that sounds like our modern world. We, we call it canceling and deplatforming. And there's these unforgivable sins that we have socially and they yeah. haven't always been there. And they also change and they morph and, and they change with the times. But what do you hear everyone these days comparing everyone to? It's Nazis, because that's our most recent memory. And that's that's kind of the trick that's that's done. You have a different opinion than me. Well, you're a Nazi and I condemn you and you get no forgiveness. And it's like, are we still talking about Satanism or are we talking about Twitter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know they they mean? move the goalposts too, like there was like a, a, you may not remember this, a few years ago, they were trying to kind of put pressure on Chris Pratt or cancel him. And one of the reasons why it was like, he made a video and then there was some criticism and then he was like, what, do you guys not hear what I'm saying? And then they literally were like, that was so insensitive that you said that because that implies that deaf people, do and they started taking it into this whole thing about when he said like, do you hear what I'm saying about how, well, that's not fair because deaf people can't hear what you're saying. And it's like they keep moving the goalposts to try to get you in trouble because they've decided they don't like you. And that sounds exactly like something uh, women do, <laughs> where they're like, what are you saying? I'm deaf? What are you saying? I can't hear? You just broke the one of the unforgivable sins, uh, making a comedic joke <laughs> about a woman. Austin, please leave the studio. You're canceled. Although you are a comedian, sorry, you, you have to keep toe in the party line but i yeah i think we see that getting to the point i think this is all a uh, propagandized media thing and and we we do the favor of doing the media's bidding today if you think about it another word uh, that comes to mind when i think about the ideology of being anti is extremists that's been a completely hijacked word too so by everyone's definition and Maybe I can get to a, a funny joke that Austin can appreciate. But by everyone's definition, everyone is an extremist, even though we all know statistically that most people are just sitting somewhere around the center. That's a statistical fact. You, yeah. you just sit around watching horrible news, tweeting, going on Facebook. Uh, not, don't really, you're not out in the streets protesting or active, acting. That's not how most people are operating they just have these beliefs and and they go on facebook they type a little something and now they are said to have extremist views so they come they go to work they come home they go on facebook they're called extremists they type out some something into the thought abyss and and they're on the internet they didn't leave the house they didn't act anything out yet they're violent extremists yeah and or violent and hateful extremists even. And the joke for Austin is 
there is nothing extreme about sitting on the sofa typing on Facebook. Yeah. It's the most banal thing that you can do. You know, protesters burn down St. John's church. That's that's extreme by comparison. Or some right winger tries to blow up a mosque. That's a little bit more extreme as well. Thinking things and talking about them or even typing about them isn't extreme. It's powerful, I think. And that's why there's this smothering suppression of censorship and attempts at to control every piece of information that anyone says. But yeah, we all have that power in a semi-free society. And I think that that's understood, but it's a trick that a lot of dictators in history have done. And it's the same thing the church did actually to take power and control as, as well, these leaders and institutions have for thousands of years. And it leads to a place where today we're seizing or giving away power or authority under the belief that information is actually killing people or the idea that someone's thoughts are extremist views or when you type them out completely in an, a vacuum uh, that is the internet yeah you are an extremist yeah it's it's thought crime it's if you can control the language you can can if you can ban words if you can take away words and language or even just take words and then change the meaning to them uh, yeah if you do that you have you have taken away someone's vocabulary. You have taken away their ability to speak out because how can you speak if you have no words to do so? Yeah, I um, I think that that's what's going on. That's why I had to make the point that we're talking about uh, two guys that murdered two people, uh, bullying the big bad church. I think that is a uh, at least a hint that we've maybe not been propagandized, but we're kind of looking at it a little bit. Yeah, uh, off center. I, I I really do not believe in the media. Um, I wanted to touch on kind of the archetypes and the the energy of youth. I thought that was pretty exciting. But what I really believe behind all of this is a media propagandizing campaign where yeah. they are, and it, it sounds like I started off talking about when you simply blame one institution you're a pseudo intellectual and a, a comedian a failed comedian but yeah the industry the media does a, a really good job at these things like i said we're we're sitting here talking about two murders and there's a there was a study actually in lords of chaos about it's called the media construction of satanism in norway and it basically outlines you know starting in 1988 a pair of brothers stole some items from a church and a satanic Bible was found in a drug bust, right? Two years later, in 1990, a cop lied saying they had evidence of that satanic criminal activity was an impending epidemic, right? Wow. And then they say now it's an organized crime wave yes. of sacrifice it is in their midst, you know? Does this satanic sound like, terrorists, yeah. This sounds like a witch hunt boogeyman scenario. So then black metal appears years, years later, by the way. And then we have teenagers now going evil after reading about it in the press. And as we know, that that's actually really effective. From 91 to 93, there were two murders, a total of two. And at this point, any sign of weird ritualistic scenery or whatever, if, even if it was confusing and it wasn't actually a ritualistic scene, it was now widely covered in the press as a ritualistic scene, no matter what the crime was or no matter what the paraphernalia found was. In years after that, we get churches being burned. So now the church has declared that they have an enemy. The media prints wild stories that are mostly lies and inspired, inspired the youth to either one-up or copycat behavior, which we know happens, obviously, if you listen I'm going to shamelessly plug the latest single. That it starts off by saying suicide is contagious. That's from Emil Durkheim's study on suicide and how contagious it is, especially when it's publicized and made infamous, you know. And yeah. you can consider that with what we call copycat murders or copycat shooters or mass shooters today um, seeking recognition and infamy. 
And so now there are articles about Satanists eating babies. You know, these, these are completely made up. There's never any babies found. There's never any Satanist eating babies found, and there's never anyone convicted of these things. So they're proven lies by police departments. And then there are some people now claiming to have been part of these human sacrifices, yet there are no cults. There are no dead bodies. There is nothing found. You just have a couple, what we would call unreliable witnesses. But the, the media has these great stories to mythologize. And yeah. even Arge himself solicited himself to the media. They didn't find him somewhere and conduct his interviews. So I think the media is, is the reason that we're sitting here talking about this t- today, even yeah. con- considering that a couple church burners can bully the institution of the, of the church. And it's, it's interesting to me because it has a musical element to it you know yeah you don't often get those there's not too often that you get some interesting story like this with tied to, to music so that's cool but i think it's a you know statistical average that a handful of murders that will happen probably like some dark music and just to bring it kind of to modern thinking we never read about a gang shootout that was fueled by a hip hop song that forced them to murder because they were participating in a ritualistic behavior like smoking weed and drinking and dancing in dark clubs. To <laughs> like. Yeah. That's, that sounds ridiculous right now as I say it, right? Yeah. Well, that's what they were saying then and we believed it. So when you zoom out and look at you know, what we're talking about, it's obvious that it's a media construction. And especially when you consider... 800 people are being murdered in a couple neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, now, if I say these neighborhoods contain a lot of rappers, is this a 400-fold epidemic? Because statistically, that's what it would be. But it's never presented in that way, nor should it be, but nor should have this been. You know, yeah. If I say 12,000 people die from falling down the stairs a year, why are we talking about two murders? Yeah. You know, the Christian Crusades killed 5 million. The hooligans for football clubs kill more people in a, in a weekend. So I'm not really offering a, an opinion or, or whatever, but it, it's just something to put into per- perspective that yeah, yeah the dude. meeting repeatedly creates a, a witch hunt or makes a witch hunt or creates a scapegoat or a boogeyman. And it's it's really easy to get possessed by that type of stuff, isn't it? Yeah, and then the media, and then they hammer it and hammer it and hammer it and hammer it until people start to believe it or just um, give in or acquiesce to it. I just, you know, Trump comes to mind with um, just from the get go, the media demonizing him to the point of uh, destroying him. But one thing that I found fascinating that in what Trump was right on is he he would. He was talking about the media and giving all this uh, publicity to the mass shooters. He was against it. He was like, stop giving them all this publicity. And he said that towards the be- at the beginning of his term. And I paid attention to it just to see, like, all right, how many mass shootings are there? Well, like, well, you know, what is, what is the media uh, propaganda, uh, propagating? And it turns out like there was hardly, if, if there were a lot of mass shootings, they were not spoken of during his term. But the second that he was out and Biden was back in, all of a sudden it's mass shooting, you know, every single week, all this is going on, all, all these killings, and that's all they were talking about. So I think that um, it's possible that he did stop the media from really... Um, hammering these these mass shootings it could it could be uh that they were so obsessed with talking about him and his uh coll- yeah. russian collusion that they they had no time for mass shooters because you know he took precedence pretty much over everyone but yeah that's true if you and if you don't want to listen to uh, to trump about your sociological studies you can just uh listen to jonathan Haidt, who says you know other countries do not publish these mass shooters and they somehow don't happen and um there's sociological studies that that 
kind of bore this out regardless if you think it's a man i yeah i could really go hard or i could go off on the mass shooting thing because they they always say the statistics too like when there's a mass shooting uh, like an actual one where someone goes into a school and kills innocent kids they're always like this is the third hundred mass shooting this year and people believe that and it's like okay idiot you really think 300 people are going out here and causing these mass shootings but they just randomly chose to talk about this one no, it's because they're they're adding in their gang violence and things like that. If these people were serious about ending mass shootings, they would go after handguns. And the other thing that's interesting is that if you take out major cities out of the equation, we actually have a very low uh, gun crime rate, you know. But every time that there's there ever is a big mass shooting, they do talk about it, but they won't talk about it depending on who the shooter is. Because we've had some people that have gone out over the past couple of weeks here and have shot white people. And that is not a mainstream yeah. headline. They'll, they'll start reporting on it and they're like, whoa, whoa, pull back. The shooter is black. There is not a story. Here. Yeah. Like I think the last guy was a black transgender guy. They didn't talk about that on, on the headlines, but that's exactly the case of point is what you're saying with like mayhem. You know, people, the media want to talk about mayhem because that's interesting to write about and that's going to get the public imagination going and papers are in the business of selling papers. A lot of people don't know what a mass shooting means. Um, also, so it's good to take into account that a mass shooting is a shooting that injures. I great. I of course can't. Like is two it two or three people? more people, or is it? Yeah, it's a it's a, a shooting that injures a few people. So calling it a mass shooting is kind of misleading it also doesn't have to prove fatal you know if i shoot and wound three people and myself i'm a mass shooter <laughs> and it kind of, again it's framed nicely in a media package where you know there's a there's a boogeyman here and rightfully so it is it is a bad person and uh, i read a funny article that this guy wrote I don't know if he was white or black, but he said the country's first black school shooter, um, it was about what he thought was going on there. And I kind of find it strange that people actually believe that nobody black ever shot a school up. And you, it's not a, a racial idea, but uh, I know firsthand that this happens, and and usually, granted, it, it isn't a mass shooting, but usually most shootings aren't mass shooting. If someone has a problem with someone, say, in some of these school systems, they bring a gun to school, they shoot them at school. Yeah. Yeah. And they they shoot the guy they have a problem with, and that's most shootings. Most shootings don't uh, play out like I'm going to pack up and go crazy and, and shoot a dozen people. That's why we cover them because they're so exceptional and uncommon. Exactly. But the gun crime that's happening in urban areas and in violent cities is ops, people bringing guns to school and shooting the their enemy or their op that they have a problem with yeah. and does not get put down in the sociological data that this is a a school shooting so people are actually running around believing that only white people do school shootings which is pretty funny but it also shows you the power of the media and yeah. how it can shape a narrative and a belief system and people are actually out here screaming about it as if they know it to be a fact the power of media and the power of labeling. So I want to that we've we've done a very broad view of of black metal really as like this movement. I do kind of want to zoom in though on and we've talked about it multiple times, but I would be kind of curious. I don't know as someone in a band, David, what your the the band dynamics of Mayhem are are like interesting, but also kind of funny in a lot of dark ways. I mean, for one, I've I've always kind of gotten a kick out of Necro Butcher and uh, Varg from Mayhem. And that the band was so the, the dynamic there where it's like you have Euronymous living with dead. Supposedly he's in dead's ear all the time telling him to kill himself or bothering him. Uh, this guy, Euronymous, Austin says, you don't know anything about the band. He would play like synth music that dead hated. So dead would like took his pillow and went out to sleep in the woods. 
So then Euronymous went out in the woods with a shotgun and started shooting at birds. So that way Dead couldn't even sleep like, <laughs> out in the, in the damn woods. So then uh, Dead eventually kills himself. Euronymous comes home one day. He doesn't have a key to the place. He goes to open up the window that was in Dead's room that was unlocked. He crawls in there and he finds Dead with his brains literally blown out all over the place. Euronymous leaves the house, goes back into the city, gets a camera, goes back, rearranges the suicide scene, puts like the shotgun and knife on him and stuff, takes the picture of him, takes fragments of his skull before he, um, before he calls the police, um, supposedly makes necklaces out of his skull and gives it to black metal musicians who are worthy. Uh, all these rumors start that he took some of his brain and ate it so he could be a cannibal, all this stuff. Um, Euronymous then they use the cover or they use this picture of uh, dead dead um, as the cover of like a live EP or something like that. So then down the road, um, you know, you got Varg who's in the mix. I believe he was like the bass player. He's the guy who's kind of burning churches and was about the life that that he was talking about. Um, Varg eventually uh kills Euronymous. Now I, th- I saw a thing on a side note that supposedly like Euronymous had snitched on Varg uh to the media and to the police that Varg was burning the churches and he's who got him arrested. But either way, Varg stabs uh Euronymous to death and to this day is still talking shit about him. I just saw an interview where Varg was saying that Euronymous is a homosexual. So all these years later he's still like, oh yeah, he was a closet homosexual. And then uh, in the mix, then you got Necro Butcher, who every interview this guy does is wild. And he's, I saw one where he was like, I was going to kill Euronymous myself. <laughs> and so um, it's just like, people are like, whatever you think your favorite band is, whatever drama they have, it's nothing compared to mayhem. What it- <laughs> yeah, I find it fascinating that a guy named Dead ends up dead. Yeah, that's kind of the whole, they, they mentioned that multiple times in the book, Lords of Chaos, where they're like, you know, that was... Uh, that's kind of what he was about. He seemed obsessed with death. That they have some of his writings in the book, and to me, it just seems like r- very depressed rambling. But yeah, <laughs> what do you think about the uh, band dynamic there, David? Is is King like that? Yeah, that sounds about like King, actually. <laughs> about it, I forgot who you might have been talking about, but <laughs> yeah, I I don't know any of them personally, so just yeah. judging it as an outsider. Yeah, to me, Bard kind of seems like an iconoclast a guy that's going to go against whatever um he went to prison came out and had a lot of i hate to use this term but it's accurate in this context of the racist nazi anti-semitic kind of beliefs of course yeah Um, again i it's such a a trammeled well they say that about everybody but he actually was probably- yeah he actually is so he he believes you know in the, the norwegian people and their race almost like he i believe he had an affinity for the germans as well but anyway um he seems to me i say this not as a moral judgment because i i honestly don't care I understand and I'm happen to be an adult that is completely aware that people with unsavory beliefs exist in the world. I just know that to be a fact. Uh, It has to be true statistically. So I say that to say, though, that he seems like the type of guy that just is anti, which is what I was talking about earlier. He he seems like the type of guy who's going to, you know, be against whatever the grain is. Yeah. The the dead to me always just seemed like a misanthrope. Um a young these these guys are young. I, I forget how old he was when he killed himself, but I believe tw- twenty. Twenty, yeah. So I I didn't I wanted to kill myself when I was twenty as well, and I didn't have the world figured out either. Yeah. Euronymous strikes me as um, a bit inauthentic and a guy who really wanted to be in the spotlight. He was a bit of an opportunist, obviously. If you if you yes. find your friend's head laying all over the room, you most of the time do not drive into the city to get a camera. And also he 
took credit for a bunch of burnings he didn't do and he was he was a bit of a poser and where i come from if two friends have it out and one stabs the other to death um you don't really have to think it through philosophically they just had a disagreement one killed the other and yeah. that's not very uncommon to me so i don't like to get uh sensationalizing all of the the details yeah um he i believe varg revises history a lot so he could be coming with well yeah he even says now he's like dead killed himself with ammo that i gave him i mean like he puts his hands on everything yeah including his skull um i don't know it's almost as if there's a thing where there's some attention and there's some interest so they're feeding that flame no pun intended and it doesn't strike me as what strikes me as they really believe these things and they're and they're really going for it and they live in this certain way but mostly to me it's so shocking to outsiders because it's of the novelty yeah. The novelty in the in the case, you know, they're not it's not just two friends disagreeing and stabbing each other in Flint that happens every week. Um it's they happen to be wearing face paint with it. They happen <laughs> yeah. to believe the same thing. They're playing music or they're in a band. Oh, cool. You you always see this. You've seen this with the Columbine shooters as well. They went and found that they wrote nine inch nails lyrics on the wall on their in their journals. And Marilyn Manson, I remember that was a big one. Yeah, exactly. That's what we had in America. And they did the same thing with Deicide and with the other things. And to the musicians, you know, they don't have anything at stake because it doesn't have anything to do with them. You know, a lot of them are, in fact, beer drinking, venom loving type of individuals that that were described. Even something like Demi Bourgeur, they were, I think, one of the most successful of the black metal bands. And they didn't it says in Lords of Chaos, when they did a photo shoot, they did a super clean one of them sacrificing a virgin. And then they did a super bloody one of them sacrificing a virgin, uh, as far as a promo shot goes, as if yeah. they knew that servicing them to different press outlets would be the most beneficial for their cause. So I think Uranus was an opportunist. So obviously, he was. He, he tried to open a record store, and he wanted that record store to be successful. And... It wasn't, but Varg, I think, you know, he he might be under the spell of some of these ancestral primordial things and beliefs. Whether they're sound, I'm not sure, and I I don't think they are. Again, because I I don't believe that you can really be anti um, in a way that really makes sense. So, so uh, another guy i believe a guy from the oto is interviewed in lords of chaos and he says why weren't they burning churches down when people were having services or why you know if if this is really the yeah. the goal and the, and they really were these what they called heathens yeah why were the casualties too that's exactly what and and you know again barge he solicited the media himself and and these things he he seems to like the commentary and it's it's funny because everyone is really into this ideology and this this kind of cult or this this movement and you know you get hipsters on the east coast re, you know loving this stuff and wearing all the the gear but the truth is these hipsters would be reporting all of these figures for misinformation and dis- disinformation and hate speech if they were on Twitter today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. None do. of these people um, would like any of you or agree with anything you're doing and vice versa. I talked to a guy once who uh, knew, I, be- I believe him that he knew Darby Crash. Um, this guy's from California. He'd have been about Darby's age. I-, I really believe that he knew him. And we were talking about these punk bands and how these guys are like, I can't wait to be famous. And um. I'm so punk and I'm so this and I'm so that. And he's like, dude, Darby would hate those guys. <laughs> yeah. And and rightfully so. And I, I think that a lot of the, I think a lot of envy and bitterness and jealousy 
yeah it's present in the early black metal days like i said the founders of of black metal were successful entertainers in english the what a lot of the spokespersons in the movement in norway said was this is real black you know we're the real deal those guys are industry posers and to some degree they're right yeah. they were industry posers and the industry did infect the genre and ruin it like like the industry so commonly does but that wasn't a statement alone in itself it could also be the case that you were jealous someone yeah. got success that wasn't as real as you they got success and and they didn't burn any churches they have success and they don't and that's kind of a the envy thing and the jealousy thing and the bitterness you can find traces of it on some of the guys and of course that's completely normal we're talking about 18 year olds and yeah so i'm, I'm not immune to that emotion as as a teenager either of course but we should just try to look at it for what it is, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that we, I, I really like kind of how we covered this. Um, I think that this was a unique approach really uh, into black metal. It's, it's, it's exactly what I wanted to, to accomplish with it. So um, with that being said, though, I did want to talk about a new segment, which I think a lot of people will be pumped up for. Uh, on Toolshed Art Club, we wanted to do, I'd approach you, David, with this idea that we do a boogeyman book club. What I wanted to do is once or twice a month, maybe maybe once a month, we'll give the people time to read the book. But, um, you know, you kind of, you present a book that you recommend uh, people read, and then we'll come back to it in a few weeks, and uh, we'll talk about it in greater detail. And so, can you talk about uh, the first book that you wanted to review? Yeah, I've, I've talked about this book a bunch. And I, people are aware that I like it, obviously, but it's called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And I've never talked about the actual book. I just recommend it to some people. But I, yeah. when you asked me about it, I was most recently rereading it. I read it twice a year, probably. So nice. um, it just came to mind as a relevant thing to start with, I guess, as a framework to it's it's very it's not mo it's not recent or modern but the ideas definitely are still resonating yeah and so the the book for people to check out uh, is called amusing ourselves to death what who's the author on that again yeah neil postman um i i had to order a copy of it i'm i'm familiar with it i've seen you post about it i've seen you talk about it but um i hadn't actually bought it yet so i had to purchase it online so um, order it online or go into a bookstore or wherever you're at, but amusing ourselves to death. Then in a few weeks, what we'll do is we'll kind of come back and we'll have a conversation about the book and, um, you know, we'll, we'll go into greater detail. And if anybody, anyone who reads the book, if, if they have any questions, you know, feel free to hit up Toolshed Art Club on social media. And, uh, we're on all social media cause we're all about amusing ourselves to death. Um, send, send us some questions there and, and, um, I, I'm a huge believer that there are stupid questions. So if you ask a smart question, maybe it'll be on the show. So, yeah, but but so amusing ourselves to ask, check that out, and we'll get back to it. Uh, David, again, thank you for for coming on uh, on the show today. Uh, again, everybody, check out uh, King Eight One Zero. Check out the store. Check out the latest album. Do you have any new any new tour dates or anything that that uh, people should have a heads up on? We have a couple of festivals coming up. One is in Belgium called Alcatraz. That's the first week of August. And one is called Bloodstock. It's in the UK. And that is also the first week of August. I believe we just moved the date to blood of Bloodstock. We're playing the Thursday, okay. which is August 10th. That's 810. Wow, okay. So um that thursday we're playing at bloodstock in the uk and then that saturday we're playing in belgium and then we're going to try to finish this next godforsaken piece and then we have a tour in the uk and europe in november called never say die so i'll probably talk to you a few times before that since november 
Now, here's what I'm trying to figure out is if I dare ask you, when are you going to do a tour in America? I think we're talking about doing something in December right now. So that would be later in the year as well. That would be really cool if you could, if you swing through our hood, we'll all, we'll definitely come out to the show. You know, what would be cool, honestly, is uh, I've been thinking about this, is if you guys come through, we could do some sort of a live uh, podcast and uh, do it with you. That might be cool, but um, that's a fantasy for another day. But it was good talking to you, man. We'll do it uh, again next week if it works for you.